We are live. A pleasant good morning and welcome to this virtual discussion on the book, Caribbean Perspectives on Criminology and Criminal Justice, Volumes 1 and 2. I am Dr. Christine Descartes, lecturer in psychology in the Department of Behavioral Sciences, the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. I will be your moderator for this event. I wish to warmly welcome the head of Department of Behavioral Sciences, Dr. Talia Esnad, the editor of this book, Dr. Wendell C. Wallace, all our valued book authors and contributors, fellow colleagues, students, participants, and attendees. It brings me immense joy that we can all come together in support of the advancement of scholarship and our knowledge base. This two volume edited book, which will be discussed today is a direct response to the call made by Ken Price in 1976 to develop and strengthen a Caribbean criminology mainly because of the region's unique socio-historical and colonial legacy. The book is a reflection of some of the work that started many years ago. And it would be remiss of me if I did not recognize some of the criminologists who have paved the way and contributed tremendously to understanding Caribbean criminology and the criminal justice system within the region, to name a few. Professor Ramesh Diusaran, Professor Charles Katz, who's here with us today, Professor Anthony Harriot, Dr. Dan Williams, Dr. Randy Sipasad, and of course, Dr. Wendell C. Wallace, whose book has brought us here today. This book features both single and co-authored work of regional and international researchers, as well as policymakers who saw the need to share their findings within an empirically and theoretically oriented framework. Today, we have with us a selection of the book chapter authors, and each one will be presenting an overview of their unique contributions. So while the discussions center on core criminological and crim criminal justice issues, this book puts forth a rich compilation of interdisciplinary research, which is pertinent to the Caribbean regional and global society. The importance of this edited book as an interdisciplinary academic co collection cannot be understated, as crime, as you know it, is a pervasive issue that touches the lives of every Caribbean citizen. So international initiatives like this one, which aim to explore this phenomenon, should not only be encouraged, but celebrated. Today, this discussion should take us all on an investigative journey into crime, and its mechanisms through the unique lens of the Caribbean context. I prepare you for an exciting indulgence where the authors will connect so seamlessly research, theory, and practice. Let us all appreciate that we all stand here today at the forefront of criminological explanation and scholarship advancements. Before we begin, I would like to thank each one of you, not only for your initiative and drive, but for your relentless participation in the quest for a greater understanding of this world and the pursuit of a kinder, more harmonious and balanced environment for all. These events are only small, incremental yet effective steps forward towards these larger selfless goals. Let us all take a moment to appreciate the value of the work being done here and the many lives which are and will be forever changed by the progressions in the field. At this time, I would now like to invite Dr. Talia Esnard, the head of the Department of Behavioral Sciences at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, and lecturer in sociology to give the opening remarks. Dr. Esnard, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Descartes. Um, thank you for the invitation and thank you all greetings, so warm greetings to all on behalf of the Department of Behavioral Sciences. It is with, indeed with great pleasure that I warmly welcome each and every one of you this morning to this virtual session today, whether by Zoom or by YouTube. I am certainly delighted 
that you have made all the effort and time to share with us this virtual and discussive space. By design, the virtual sessions offers us, as a department, the opportunity to feature some of the scholarly work of our staff, and in some cases, students, while engaging our wider stakeholders, both within and outside of the university. Our first seminar, which was held in August this year, was a healthy engagement of ministry officials, staff, and the media on matters affecting peer conflict and mediation in the context of Trinidad and Tobago. Our session today follows the successful footprints of that first seminar. With a focus on advancing interdisciplinary work on criminology and criminal justice systems in the context of the Caribbean, today's panel extends that discussion on a much needed theorization and contextualization of these issues. It is therefore fitting that I publicly recognize the milestones that have been created through this project. First, the engagement of academic colleagues across diverse academic ranks and institutions the mentorship of and collaboration with graduate students within the sustained project, the multidisciplinary nature of the scholarship across both volumes with contributions, for example, from researchers in the literary field, sociology, international relations, and the like. And of course, with the successful production of two edited volumes within the space of two years. As a young scholar, and by that, I, I am not using this in a typical dismissive and hierarchical term whatsoever. I am using it in a recognition of a researcher, a scholar, an academic, who in a short period of time has managed successfully the production of two edited volumes. And of course, this is not just commendable, it's encouraging. It's encouraging most certainly for the ones who desire to be bold, to denounce the othering of scholarship from the global south, to the ones who desire to push the button, not when they are told that they are ready to do so, but when they feel that they are ready. And to the ones who would like to think outside the box, not to strive for accomplishments and gaps and mechanisms and ways and paths that are set for themselves, but the ones that they set for themselves. It is a great pleasure therefore, and against those considerations, and with the productive defiance that is evident in this work, that I would like to congratulate Dr. Wallace on what he has accomplished today, and of all the authors and the contributors who have been part of this volume. This productive defiance and the thinking and practices of the academic space is indeed commendable. To all of you, I wish you a successful virtual discussion. And again, I cannot leave without saying again, congratulations. This project is a milestone in more ways than one. I thank you and Dr. Descartes, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Esnard. So we now move on to the presentations from three of the, the book chapter authors of volume one. After the presentation from the authors of each volume, we will have an answer and question segment. So with us today, our first presenter is Professor Charles Katz. Professor Katz is the Watts Family Director of the Center for Violence Prevention and Community Safety and is a professor in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Arizona State University. His work focuses on police transformation and strategic responses to crime. He has also worked with the Ministry of National Security of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to develop a co comprehensive strategic plan to reform the Trinidad and Tobago police services. He also worked for the Eastern Caribbean's regional security system to diagnose the gang problem in nine Caribbean nations and develop a regional, a regional approach to responding to gangs. Professor Katz, I now invite you to make your presentation. Over to you.
sorry, let me one second. Um, there we go. So uh, thank you very much for having me, uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today. I especially want to thank um, Dr. Wallace for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, 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 share a manuscript that I had been working with uh, a couple of people that I wanted to make sure to give uh, uh, credit to. Uh, Andrew Fox, who was a former PhD student of mine, at Arizona State University, who's now the head of research at the state of Washington, as well as one of his students, Lexi Gill, uh, who was at the University of Missouri at Kansas City and now is working toward her PhD. Uh, we collaborated together on a project that started years ago, uh, looking at the relationship between structural factors in Trinidad and Tobago uh, and their contribution toward homicide and gangs in that nation. And it had to do with some unique data that we had at the time. Uh, it was unique at that time. And what we wanted to do was really look at what might be associated or the relationship between gangs and homicide uh, in Trinidad at the neighborhood level. Uh, there had not been a lot of neighborhood level work done uh, quantitatively. Uh, there had been some really good qualitative work that had examined some of these issues, including Dr. Wallace's that we feature in the chapter. Uh, but here we wanted to focus a little bit more on the, quanti or the quantitative uh, issues at play and look at the relationship uh, between gangs and homicide in Trinidad. So what we did was, as part of a larger project that had been funded by the government of Trinidad and Tobago, we uh, had collected uh, three pieces of data, or three uh, data from three sources. One was a gang expert survey. Uh, this was a survey that had originally been developed through a Eurogang research program uh, years ago. Uh, where they developed a sort of a general definition of gangs that would work in a variety of nations around the globe and has since been tested and worked really well, where you survey gang experts at the neighborhood level. Uh, we chose to do it with police officers in Trinidad and Tobago. We administered the survey to the uh, uh, individual or investigator who the station district uh, commander believed was most appropriate uh, to fill out the survey and who had the most knowledge about gangs. Uh, and fortunately, we had about 100, uh, we did have a 100% response rate back in 2006. Now, this survey has been uh, conducted since then, but uh, it was one of the few pieces of data that we had that was linkable to homicide data as well as to the uh, census data that we had at the time. Uh, and at the same time, we had homicide data from 2006, uh, which we found was reliable and valid, just as reliable and valid as any other nation or community. And then we also had census data provided by the Bureau of Statistics in Trinidad and Tobago to be able to look at some of the socioeconomic factors in the relationship with gangs and homicide. Uh, and then we were uh, we had developed some shape files at the station district level that helped us map some of uh, some of that data. Now, what I wanted to point out was in 2006, the homicide problem looked quite a bit different than it did a little bit before and a little bit after. Uh, as you see here on this graph, it was, it was right in the middle of when we started to see a substantial increase in homicides in Trinidad and Tobago. In about 2000, we saw a dramatic shift, uh, and that shift was largely being driven by guns. Uh, what we see is uh, uh, what we saw at this time was that uh, cutlasses, sharp instruments, uh, uh, objects that were used as part of homicides were fairly stable or flat, but what we saw was uh, a substantial increase in the number of homicides that were committed with guns, and that was really driving the violence problem there. At the time, though, we were not sure if that was associated with gangs, drugs, uh, organized crime or other factors. And we later found that it was not necessarily related to drug trafficking, but it was more, um, uh, more likely to be related to gangs and some of the uh, uh, organized activities that they were up to at that point. We also took a look at the census data using principal components analysis to take a look at the issues. Now, uh, at the time, we really didn't have too much guidance as to how we might examine some of the structural factors related 
uh, to crime in the nation of Trinidad and Tobago. So as a result, we chose the strategy of principal components analysis to really see where uh, some of these variables were going to fall and what it might uh, lead to. Now, uh, what we did was we chose to look at them through two lenses. Um, one was more of a cultural, traditional type of disadvantage, social disadvantage. The other was social and familiar disadvantage. You'll see with cultural and traditional disadvantage, principal components analysis resulted to see that, or we found that percent male residents 12 to 24 fell into this group, uh, percent foreign born, uh, residents with uh, less education, uh, less median household income, as well as um, uh, comprising individuals who had uh, been mobile or had been moved in the past year. And then we also had uh, communities that we labeled as, uh, or were more likely to have uh, issues related to social and family disadvantage. And those were communities that had higher levels of unemployment, uh, had higher numbers of family headed households with kids and had a higher proportion of African uh, or residents from African descent. We also uh, mapped out the gang problem. These findings are not going to be surprising uh, to those of you that, that live in Trinidad. Uh, you can see here uh, the number of gangs, um, by a station district, or we call neighborhood, number of gang members. Uh, you can see here that at the time, Basan Street Station District for the area of Laventille, for the most part, uh, had the largest number of gangs, 19 as, as identified through our gang experts, and had about 385 uh, gang members at that time. Uh, that was followed by the communities of um, uh, San Juan, um, 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 and, and several others, but it, it was looking fairly similar, right? We had some similar trends here in terms of the communities that had a high number of gangs, high number of gang members, but we did look at it separately for analytical purposes in terms of what might be associated with homicides. Is it number of gangs and number of gang members? Quite frankly, we found that it didn't make much difference, but we did look at it both ways. Uh, and so for our analysis, what we did was we looked at, uh, for our dependent variable, we used the number of homicides. Our in independent variables included our measure of social family disadvantage, cultural and traditional disadvantage, a number of gangs, number of gang members. We also did have uh, density, population density in there. For analysis, Katz, we used Professor negative five. Yes. Can, is your PowerPoint isn't up? Oh, I thought that it was up. I apologize. Wonderful. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, that would make quite a bit of a difference here. So um, what we found was, or what we, uh, what we used was negative uh, binomial regression uh, to examine our data. Uh, that's because our outcome variable was a count variable, a uh, number of homicides. Um, is what we were examining and the factors associated with higher numbers of, of homicides. Uh, and we also did examine whether or not there was any spatial clustering, which can affect a number of issues in the analysis. There's a Moran's eye test. I'm not going to get into it here, uh, but we found that that was not significantly associated uh, or spatial clustering was not a problem for our analysis. Um, and so, as you can see here, uh, through our negative binomial analysis, that we did have a number of significant uh, factors that were associated with homicide. One was uh, cultural tr traditional disadvantage was negatively associated with homicide, and I'll get into what exactly how we might interpret that in a second with respect to its association uh, with homicides. We also saw that uh, higher levels of social family disadvantage was related to homicide, as well as the number of gangs and gang members uh, was associated with uh, a homicide. In this particular model, we were controlling for gang members. We found the exact same results uh, when we controlled for gangs. We did have to run these in two different models 
uh, due to the fact that we had multicollinearity that was taking place when they were both in the same model. But one of the things that we found that was of particular interest was uh, when we looked at extreme levels of disadvantage. We did that through um, uh, squaring um, our independent variables of disadvantage. Uh, and what we found was that it was significantly associated with a cultural or traditional disadvantage or homicides were associated with cultural uh, disadvantage. Uh, so what, we, what, that, what that suggests is that neighborhoods that have extreme levels of cultural or traditional disadvantage have lower rates of homicide. And I wanna emphasize that. Uh, extreme levels of cultural or traditional disadvantage have uh, exhibited lower rates of homicide, meaning that those communities that had extremely high levels of poverty, uh, a higher proportion of uh, young males, a fewer foreign born, uh, residents with much lower levels of education, and those where there was a lot of mobility had uh, substantially less uh, or fewer homicides than other communities. Now, on the other hand, we found that communities that had higher levels of social or family disadvantage had higher levels of, of homicide, meaning communities that had higher levels of unemployment, female-headed households, uh, and residents, uh, higher proportion of residents of African descent. Um, that's pretty traditional in terms of what we find in other nations, regardless of the, of the nation. Unemployment, high numbers of female-headed households are uh, associated with higher levels of, of violence. Um, when it came to the findings related to gangs and gang members, in order to interpret our findings a little bit easier, uh, I converted them um, to make them a little bit easier to understand. And what you see here is that with increases in the number of gangs, uh, gang members, we see substantial increases in number of homicides. So take, for example, for uh, every 100 gang members in a neighborhood, we saw the number of homicides increase by about 50%. That is taking into consideration, or put another way, controlling for the uh, socio-demographic characteristics or the structural uh, covariates of the communities that we were looking at. Uh, the same thing can be found for the number of gangs. Um, if there were five gangs in a community, uh, there were about 50% more homicides. Uh, now, these findings should not be surprising. Uh, not only are gangs and gang members associated for a disproportionate amount of crime in communities, but we also know that when uh, gangs and gang members are in the same communities, are in the same areas, we have higher levels of violence due to the amount of conflict between those groups. If we only have one gang in a community, uh, it has a pretty pretty minor effect. There is an effect, but it's pretty minor because there's less opportunities or fewer opportunities for gangs to get into conflict with one another. But when we have a higher number of gangs and gang members, there's greater opportunities for those individuals to have contact with one another. And for all sorts of reasons, whether it be uh, for instrumental purposes, such as uh, uh, drug trafficking or for more um, 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 uh, issues related to turf, um, issues related to um, 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 uh, disrespect, uh, we also see. But either way, uh, those issues are typically driven or problems are driven by gang members having contact with one another. So the greater number of gangs and gang members we did find was associated with homicides. Uh, what I would like to point out is that our data are not longitudinal, uh, they're cross-sectional. Uh, so our findings are only uh, uh, illustrative of uh, associations between social structural factors and homicides. We didn't necessarily get into the issues of causation and whether or not uh, the number of gangs actually caused increases in homicides. But with that, thank you very much. And I do apologize for my uh, PowerPoint not being up for about half the presentation. Uh, if anybody would like a copy of it, don't hesitate to uh, contact me or Dr. Wallace, who will have a copy of this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Katz. This was quite interesting and um, I would say very interesting um, presentation here. The next presenter 
is Dr. Suzette Houghton. Dr. Houghton is a senior lecturer in the Department of Government at the University of the West Indies Mona Campus, Kingston, Jamaica. She lectures on international security issues and public international law. She was a Commonwealth scholar whose research spans security, threats affecting the Americas. Dr. Houghton has published extensively on drug trafficking, border security, border disputes, and their impacts on the nation states and on the lived experiences of citizens. I would now like to call on Dr. Houghton to make a presentation. Over to you, Dr. Houghton. Okay, good morning, colleagues. Thanks, Dr. Christine Descartes. I am indeed delighted to be a part of this team today. Before I begin my overview of, of my chapter, I would like to extend congratulations to the entire team who contributed to the Caribbean Perspectives on Criminology and Criminal Justice, Volumes 1 and 2. Well done. I would also like to extend congratulations and to say thanks to Dr. Wendell Wallace, the editor of the volumes. These volumes indeed have been timely in adding to the scholarship and in filling gaps on criminology and criminal justice in the Caribbean region. Dr. Wallace, you have brought together a team of scholars from different academic institutions and disciplinary backgrounds to converge and to research on the crime problematique in the region. These types of synergies have yielded the interdisciplinary research captured in the volumes. So thank you. My chapter is a co-authored um, piece with Dr. Trevor Smith from the UWI Mono, and it's entitled Jamaica's Transnational Crime Problems of Drug Trafficking and Money Laundering. Now, who could really believe that a country with 2.9 million people, 10,990 square kilometers, that's just about 4,000 240 square miles, one that is situated in the Caribbean, would be such a major player in the transnational crime problems of drug trafficking and money laundering. Size, geographic location, culture, people are often determinants in the security narrative in Jamaica. Drug trafficking and the laundering of drug monies pose a significant threat to people, to rule of law, and of course, to democratic societies. Proceeds from the trafficking of marijuana and cocaine is believed to be laundered into formal businesses. Although the Jamaican state has implemented many measures to curb transnational crimes. There is a belief that crime control is not keeping pace with the high levels of crime. Hence, Dr. Smith and I were motivated to conduct a thorough review of Jamaica's transnational crime problem, particularly drug trafficking and money laundering. Our chapter benefited from desk-based research and secondary source official governmental data to explore Jamaica's case of those two problems. We had two broad objectives. First, we aim to explore the nature of drug trafficking and money laundering across Jamaica's borders. 
And we did that by incorporating the theory of rational choice. And secondly, we explored crime control measures used by the state to address these, these two issues. In applying the rational choice theory to Jamaica's transnational crime problems, we argue that decision to engage in drug trafficking and money laundering is based on individuals calculation of the cost and the benefits of engaging in such acts. The lucrative nature of such engagements serves as motivation for these criminal acts. Offenders who break the law to engage in these activities consider both personal and situational factors before doing so. They consider the material benefit to be derived, coupled with the vulnerability of the target and efficiency of law enforcement activities. To decide to engage in drug trafficking, traffickers would establish the potential financial returns, it must be lucrative. They determine the security devices installed at ports, the effectiveness of maritime patrols, the availability and ease of corrupting port workers with bribes, the ease of delivering drugs to targeted destinations, the ease of moving large amounts of cash across state borders, and the ease of trafficking drug proceeds into lawful businesses. If the calculations are deemed favorable, traffickers engage in these acts, Alternatively, the uh, individuals opt for more lawful means to attain their desired goals of obtaining um, monies. The chapter recommends that Jamaica should continue to collaborate with external partners to provide training to multiple stakeholders who are central to curbing drug, drug trafficking and money laundering activities. It also calls for the strengthening of Jamaica's criminal justice system by increasing the capacity of state law enforcement, the prosecutorial powers and the court system to effectively and efficiently prosecute financial crimes. I thank you for listening and I now turn over to Dr. Descartes. Thank you so much Dr. Houghton. A very interesting, very thought-provoking um, overview on the chapter. Um, as we move on, our next speaker is Dr. Sandra Evans a lecturer in linguistics in the Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics, and the coordinator of the postgraduate program in linguistics at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. Dr. Sandra Evans specializes in forensic linguistics, language and the law. Her research interests also include Creole linguistics, language education, language policy, and language rights in the Creole-speaking Caribbean. Dr. Evans, over to you to make your presentation. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Descartes and um, Dr. Wallace. Thank you for the in invitation to participate in this event. I, um, I know I am not a social um, scientist, uh, but I do have compatriots in social sciences. So social sciences has a, the faculty has a special place in my heart. So I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to participate in, in this event. I would also like to congratulate you and everyone else um, who contributed to the volume. Um, and I'm happy that I was able to um, be part of it. 
But I must begin by saying, when I first saw the call for papers for volume one, I was a little hesitant at first about submitting an abstract. Because after reading the call, the first thing that came to my mind was, oh no, theory. <laughs> I said to myself that if this project is coming out of the Faculty of the Social Sciences, then my paper would have to contain some sort of theoretical framework that I would most likely have to learn because the theories that, uh, that we use in linguistics are different, of course, from the ones used in the social sciences. And I was not sure that I would have, been, uh, that I would have had the time even to learn any um, new theory. But anyway, I decided to sub submit the abstract and ev eventually the chapter without um, a theory, because I thought, I said, well, okay, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. And of course, when the reviews came back, not only was a theoretical framework required, I, I, just as I had anticipated, there was also a suggestion about the one that I could use, um, of course, with which I was not familiar, but eventually had to learn. And I think I must have done a decent job with it because the paper was published. So I just wanted to start off by, um, by saying that. So my, my chapter is chapter eight and it's entitled, We Reduce It in Writing, Exploring the Status of Quayol in the Criminal Justice in St. Lucia. Now, while um, the, uh, my chapter is centered around the, the situation in St. Lucia, I thought I would talk about it in the broader context of um, the Caribbean because the, the language situations in the, in the Commonwealth Caribbean is, is the same as, as what obtains in St. Lucia. So um, I strongly believe that language is the lifeblood of the criminal justice system and should be part of any conversation or any discussion on criminology and criminal justice, particularly in bi and multilingual situations like the ones extant in the Commonwealth Caribbean, where criminal justice processes such as police investigations and court cases take place in English, which is the only language that has official status in all of these states. But it's not, the, but it's not the language of widest local currency. So we have had this kind of dominant institutional bias towards monolingualism that continues to have adverse consequences for witnesses and defendants who are monolingual or dominant speakers of Creole languages that are distinct from as in the case of St. Lucia, because in St. Lucia we, we speak uh, Quayol, which is of a different lexical base than English. It is a French lexical base um, Creole, and it is not mutually intelligible or it's not related in any way to English. So we have, uh, so on one hand, we do have, um, we have uh, situations where the Creole languages are distinct from English. And on the other hand, we, do, we, have, we have, well, most of the cases where the Creole languages do not, they include structures that are not mainstream or, or standard. All right, and that makes them, of course, totally different from um, English. So as speakers of these languages, they tend to be misunderstood or discredited and often encounter prejudice, discrimination, and potentially unfair judicial outcomes. Now, what I, what I find um, interesting is that there are a number of states around the world which they have, they were once dominated by one language. And what they have done is that they have introduced post-colonial initiatives to include local languages into inherited criminal justice systems. For example, the use or inclusion of local or unofficial languages in the courts of Africa, or the establishment of official bi or multilingual judicial systems in Asia. But in the Caribbean region, no attempt has been made to, to introduce any such initi initiatives, and they continue to perpetuate the domination of one language in the criminal justice system, and, and also in other public formal domains, despite the negative consequences for non-English um, speakers. 
I think another perhaps even more critical problem that we need to uh, draw attention to in the, in the Caribbean is that the major stakeholders in the criminal justice system, including police officers, lawyers, judges, you know, magistrates, um, they tend to be, or they seem to be relatively uninformed about the many ways in which language can serve as a barrier to justice or equal opportunity in these situations. So um, in the case of, um, of St. Lucia, and that and it is highlighted in my in my chapter. I wanted to to just um, mention two critical uh, issues. The first one has to do with the procedures of the of the police when dealing with uh, Creole speakers, because re keeping the record is so important in in the criminal justice system. Many things have to be written. Uh, well, everything almost everything have to be written down. So when a person comes to make a report or, or when a person makes us, a, a Creole speaker makes a statement in Creole, the process is that the, the person speaks in Creole and the police officer who, well, is presumably a Creole speaker because not all of them are competent in Creole. The, the, the officer takes a statement in Creole, but writes it or records it in English, all right? On the spot, it, it, that this is, this is the, the procedure. And sometimes they read, they, they say that they, they read the statement back to, to um, the person uh, in, in Creole. So we have two levels um, of interpretation happening. The first one from Creole, to English and from English back to Creole. And of course, there are concerns about the lack of training um, in interpreting or translating because, you know, I'm not aware that anywhere in the Caribbean that police officers are trained to, to um, deal with uh, non-English um, speak, the non-English speakers. And uh, interpreters are not available either uh, for um, Creole speakers. The other, the other thing I found um, relates to the, to the courts in that even though, and I found this really very curious, even though St. Lucian magistrates or lawyers, they are competent in Creole, they do not use it in, in courts. Instead, they rely on the clerk of the courts who is the designated uh, interpreter to interpret for them so much so that in some cases they can they, they can say or indicate that the that the, the interpretation is not correct yet they don't use it they rely on on the, the interpretation so i I'm hoping with regard to the benefits of this, of, of my chapter, I think what I would like to see is a greater level of awareness about the important role that language plays um, in the criminal justice system and not just language, but language status in particular, because we have those um, differences uh, it, between the languages, we have this sort of hierarchy throughout the Caribbean where English is the, the official language and the other languages are unofficial, they're non-standard, they used in, in mostly in private um, domains, you know, in family settings, that kind of thing. They are reserved for um, that kind of use. So I think what we need, what we need to do is to, get, to try to get a better understanding of the impact of language status um, on justice administration in bi and multilingual settings um, like we have in the Caribbean. And I also think that we keep, for, for too long, we have been turning a blind eye because I think we know that there is a problem and we keep turning a blind eye to language issues in, criminal, in the criminal justice system. And if we want the system to work for all people, irrespective of language differences, um, this, I, I think it is critical that we at least try to, you know, to, to get a better understanding of that. Because right now, I don't, I, I, not that I don't think, I know 
that um, the system is not working for everyone irrespective of language differences. I think I will leave it at that. So um, Dr. Descartes, it is back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Evans. I think today we heard a presentation that is so testament to much needed interdisciplinary research to understand Caribbean realities, connecting research on, on the role of language within the, the criminal justice system. So it's now that time we proceed to the questions and answer segment with the authors of volume one. I now invite participants to submit their questions. I think we, we do have um, a question um, already. Uh, we have a first question. And this question is directed to um, the authors, not anyone specific. What encouraged you to become a part of this book project when you saw the call for papers? What encouraged you to become a part of this project when you saw the call for papers? I think this one is open. Okay, can I go first? Okay. <laughs> Yes. Well, when, when I saw the call for papers, I was really excited uh, just from seeing criminal justice system because my area of research is in forensic linguistics that generally looks at um, language issues in, in the legal system or in, in the criminal justice system. And I also thought that even though I am not uh, in the social sciences and um, I am in the Faculty of Humanities and Education, but I thought that the, the role that language plays in the criminal justice system is often overlooked. And I, I just thought that I had a responsibility if I got an opportunity to talk about uh, you know, language issues in the legal system, in the, in the criminal justice systems, it, particularly in the Caribbean, uh, that you know, I thought that it would be a good opportunity to to share my research and, of course, my views on the topic because I'm very passionate about it. I I think we have this this setting, um, our our linguistic situation where, like I said earlier, English is the dominant language everywhere in the Commonwealth Caribbean, and that creates issues for speakers who are not competent in English. There are issues in Jamaica, in Trinidad, in St. Lucia, and anywhere um, in, the, in the Commonwealth Caribbean, we experience the same issues. So I thought that um, it would be a good opportunity to just draw some attention um, to it. And like you said, I, I thought it, the uh, it would be an opportunity to work with persons in the social sciences as well, you know, not, not restrict myself to just uh, humanities. Yeah, I would, uh, I would say that it, it was a, a really good opportunity that Dr. Wallace was providing um, a, a number of people to be able to present their work. Uh, Dr. Wallace is known for for uh, high quality work, producing um, uh, excellent manuscripts and uh, uh, completing the work, which oftentimes in academia doesn't happen, right? People don't finish their work uh, and I know he does. Um, and so I thought it was just a great opportunity to, to um, uh, finish a manuscript that had already been started and be able to match it with uh, other high quality work that was being conducted across the Caribbean. Uh, that leaves me. Well, there were a number of reasons why I decided to, to write for this um, volume. I, I, the first reason is that I saw the call and the call was very interesting. I realized that I could fit my own research and I've been working on drugs and, and, and drug trafficking and luxury scamming and transnational crime issues into this this call so i decided it's interested there's almost a, a a perfect fit with what i'm doing so i will um try the, the, to, i will try to send an abstract but this the second reason and, and this is a bit more personal is that i usually don't miss an opportunity to write 
So once it's there's a call and it's and I've checked out the call, it's it's something um, that is uh, legitimate. I think that there's, as the Dr. Um, Professor Katz mentioned, that the, the possibility exists that it might come to fruition. I am the person who would jump on board and 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 write. But also, this was an opportunity, I think, for more sort of. Uh, cross university of the West Indies collaboration. This was a call that was coming from a colleague of mine from St. Augustine. So I showed it to my colleague, um, Dr. Smith, and we decided that we would write. We wanted to sort of extend that type of synergy uh, with, with this call. And I'm very happy that it has come to fruition and that it's really a success. Okay, thank you, Dr. Houghton and other um, contributors. I have another question and it's directed um, to Professor Katz. The question is, what suggestions do your research in terms of this paper, as well as other research offer for dealing with gangs in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think that there's a lot of space for more work in, in uh, Trinidad and Tobago with respect to gangs. Um, I think that, that one is I do think that more neighborhood work needs to be done uh, to better understand what neighborhoods mean for crime and delinquency in the nation. Uh, a number of nations have, have embarked in that, in that line of research and it's meant something different by nation. Uh, as many of you know, neighborhoods research uh, really started and took off uh, early, in the early uh, 1900s in the United States, namely out of Chicago, and then it's uh, moved across the world. And, and what we have found is that uh, neighborhoods have a very different effect and the composition of neighborhoods have a very different effect based upon uh, the nation uh, that they're within, whether it be Brazil, Colombia. There's some really fascinating work that's come out of, out of Chile. Um, and I think that, that understanding uh, some of the protective factors that are associated with uh, criminality. In other words, what are some of the neighborhood factors perhaps that that we or governments can have an influence on that will help um, mitigate uh, the impact of crime or even the generation of crime uh, as well is as, as well worthwhile. But in, in this particular case, what I would love to see, uh, quite frankly, is more longitudinal work. Uh, I think we really need to uh, be able to develop work that has the opportunity for continued follow-up to identify some of the causative factors that are related to crime, delinquency, gangs, violence, and other, other issues, um, if we're really going to have an understanding of how we're going to alter uh, the trajectory uh, of some neighborhoods and how we're going to uh, move forward with the restoration. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Katz. Um, there's just um, one, one more question before we move on. Um, and maybe just one person can answer that question. Um, what would you say was your biggest hurdle to overcome while writing your respective chapter? So we just probably one person could respond and we move on as we have the second segment to still um, get, get to. Uh, well, like I, like I mentioned um, earlier, not being a social scientist and, um, you know, I, I know that you, that you have a different style, you know, a different writing style. To me, the biggest hurdle that I encountered was um, learning uh, the theory, the rational choice theory that I had not worked with before. And um, it was it was quite interesting. I think um, now that I can see that I have a good a good grasp of it, and um, I hope I get an opportunity, perhaps to uh, to or to work with other persons or, or to collaborate with persons in the social sciences, so I can get um, more um, ex exposure or, or practice in, in using some of those uh, theories that are quite um, that I'm finding out are quite relevant to uh, the work that I am doing. 
So uh, that I would say was was the main thing in terms of the data, the, the paper that I, the chapter is part of a broader, um, a broader work that I am conducting. So I, the, I didn't really have any other issues with um, the data. I already had that and um, and everything. So that that I think I would say, you know, was the biggest hurdle for me. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. Evans. So we have very little time, but a lot to talk about. But we, but we now must move on to the to the next segment of our discussions, where you will hear from three of the authors who contributed to volume two of the book. Our first presenter is Dr. Peter K. B. Senjan, and um, Dr. Senjan, native from of Dominica, is a sociologist a criminologist and founder of Peaceology, which he defines as a science and practice of making peace profitable. Currently, he's, he is professor and chair of the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice, chair of the criminal justice major in the School of Professional Studies and founder and executive director of the Urban Peace Lab um, at North Park University, Chicago. I now invite Dr. Senja to make his presentation. Over to you, Dr. Senja. Your, your mic. Just wait a minute, Dr. Senja, could you unmute? Okay, are we there? Great, 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 Dr. Sanger. Okay. Am I also, am I also, uh, should be um, sharing the screen as well? Is that being shared? Is the PowerPoint being shared? Yes. PowerPoint is being shared. Okay, well, uh, th thank you again for, for the opportunity. Um, and, and, and I, and I, and I I also praise uh, everything that was said before with the great work. And I was very impressed with my colleague so in the same way, we have the same problem with Creole. Uh, so it's a language that needs to be recognized. And I was glad to see this presentation from my colleague indicating that injustice is served when proper, uh, proper accolades are not given to language. So my chapter is chapter five. Thank you, colleague uh, Munset Lucy. Uh, so uh, my chapter is chapter five uh, in the second volume, whose victory introduces the conceptual framework of ideal victory as a paradigm shift moving away from politics and violence and towards politics and peace in the Caribbean region and beyond. And I'm Dr. Uh, Peter Sejan from North Park University in Chicago. In the abstract, it basically indicates that we the, the idea of violence and politics has been in our, in our language, in our mind, our lexicons for a very long time. Typically though, the trend that, that follows in the literature about violence and politics usually sees violence as some sort of mechanism for, for, for corruption and organized crime. And it, a violence kind of advertises uh, and badness, in a badness honor, as one of my colleagues from Jamaica um, says, Dr. Henry. So, the, but there is little um, emphasis being placed on issues that relate to corruption beyond just this issue of violence. Uh, and in Dominica being a, a, a mid-range country of crime, uh, as opposed to Jamaica or, or, or let's say Suriname that is on the lower end, uh, our issues are, are uh, are great in our measure, but the problems in Dominica are not as great as we see those problems in Jamaica or St. Lucia, Trinidad and Tobago and the like. So for us, it, it takes a different, uh, the, the, the definition of what we look at, although there's violence, there's murders and all that, we use, uh, in that paper I used um, the piece that is uh, used the, the World Health Organization's definition of violence that is not just necessary interpersonal violence. And it could be violence against the land, intimidation, um, and the like. Let me just put very quickly um, this, this chapter in broad context. It, it really follows my over 25 years of research, especially in, in Dominica, 
um, and has been the building of peaceology, which I define as the science and practice of making peace profitable. I'm also writing a book um, that has a tentative title of Who's Victory That May Change. Um, where, and I spent last year, I spent a month um, in Dominica and uh, yesterday, uh, well, this time last year I was in Dominica as well. I'll share with you some pictures. Um, and the and I am continuing to work on the book, and I should be in Dominica and the Grong and Dominica sometime soon. I have to tell you to to be on the lookout. If you have not loved Dominica enough, and if you have not visited Dominica enough, Dominica is about to shock the world as the first nation in the world that is going to import and export peace. Why? Because my village of Trafalgar in Dominica, and my area, my general area of the Rosa Valley, is about to introduce to the world the first time of importing and exporting peace. How, do, how are we gonna do that? Well, you're going to visit us with some good peace in your heart, some peace in your wallet, huh? and then leave with even more peace from whence you came, all right? So if you, you know us as the nature isle, but soon you'll know us as the peaceful nature isle because I'm moving my world headquarters of peaceology to my Caribbean village of Dominica. I'm beginning the World Institute of Peaceology and a lot more. Let's make peace profitable as a sustainable antidote to violence, crime, and delinquency. So the broader context, and there is more work. There will be this book that I will write, but there are other works that I'm working with some colleagues um, on, on uh, work in Dominica. And the, the, the issue for us in Dominica is not why is there so much violence. The issue for us is why isn't there even more? The problems are serious. We know a lot about how people fail. We know very little about how people succeed. We need to understand, as my colleague from St. Lucia said, the Creole language is an, a language of love. And we understand the culture of violence, but we do not understand the culture of peace. And in the Caribbean setting, as much as we have violence, we have even more peace. So in peaceology, we ask, in spite of why we know why things are so terrible, why aren't things even worse? And Dominica is a perfect setting to ask the question of why aren't things even worse? Because I was in Dominica this time last year in one of our worst times in history. And I cannot tell you the types of things that I saw that as a, as a veteran of the United States Army that I've been in, in, in more areas of combat than I could actually admit because of the type of work that I've done and have done, that I do and have done. But the, the, the chapter on the book uh, tells about some of the dynamics that occurred there. But very briefly, the connection between violence and, and, and politics, I argue, is because there's a dominant framework that I call winning at all costs, that politicians and others are working to win. Even, the, even those, the incumbents and the opposition are trying to win at all costs. We see now in the Caribbean, of long serving prime ministers. And it seems that parties want to stay on forever. And at, at the same time, we have a weakening of oppositions that seem to have less probabilities of winning. This notion of winning at all costs comes at all costs. And, and I say that the, winning, the, the, the paradigm of winning at all costs carries with it active ingredients that are more likely to initiate and accelerate violence. And I propose in the chapter something that I call ideal victory. I make very importantly a distinction between winning and victory. Winning is simply the one that gets the most, whoever gets the most marbles win. Whoever wins, the, whoever gets the most votes, um, uh, whoever gets more baskets in the, in the hoop wins. But victory is bigger than just a win. And I, I speak about a, lo a logistical, uh, uh, about a conceptual victory, which is an ideal of winning of, the, of democracy. I speak about the logistical victory, which is winning. And while, while you were playing, did you play by the rules and did you win fairly? And I speak about a, cons a, a consequential dynamic or a dimension to winning, which is after you win, what is the win worth after all? We hear about the Farrick victory that sometimes we win and we wonder if the fight was even worth it. And sometimes we are so defeated after we win that we lost and we probably were better off losing the, the, the contest. In the military, we, we, we divide these things, in, in these categories into the military victory, right? Which is the, victory, the, the battle victory and the strategic victory. The strategic victory is winning the peace. So you can win the war, but are you gonna win the peace? Strangely enough, we say that we fight for peace and there are wars for peace. But even in an election, when you win the election, can you win the peace of the people? 
So I, I say that I propose that we make a paradigm shift from winning at all costs to ideal victory, to save these countries. And the, the idea is that a victory, an ideal victory is not just a win. It is bigger than a win. It is whether or not when you win, you move the idea of the competition further ahead and even better. Whether you play it by the rules and whether after you win and you receive what you receive, you actually can help bring peace. You can bring people together or are you going to um, tear people apart? This is a picture of me in the ground zero. Some people call it on the front line. They're, they're in Marigot on the one year and one day. Um, last year, the, 20, the 3rd of December. Uh, it's kind of an emotional uh, picture for me because I had just wept at the airport. I just cried at the airport about 45 minutes before this picture because my wife and, my, uh, and uh, two of my four children had just successfully left uh, Dominica and I had just driven them through. I had to get in military mode and I had just driven them through the road blockade, moved with my bare hands, fire, and my with my daughter um, palpitating in the back seat. I shared a video, but I could not share the video of my daughter in, in, in crisis. And my wife who's a medical doctor having to, to calm her down. And um, I'm not sure if I'll even share that video with the world um, without um, my, my, my consent of my family members, especially my, my daughter that was in such, in such shock. But after I took them to the airport and the plane left and I cried uh, while the plane was leaving, I went back to the, I went back. And actually I was able to give some military advice to some of the police on the ground so we could have a, a little um, uh, um, bloodshed as possible because Dominica is a peaceful place. Uh, uh, we're not about that type of thing. Well, the, the people had just blocked the streets in the, in, the, in the constituency of the opposition to prevent people from moving back and forth to, to supposedly come in to vote, uh, presumably mostly for the, for the government. Um, you see the area here um, the, the, where the big fire was um, uh, in, in, the, in the village of Marigat uh, there. But while that was going on and while this was mostly orchestrated by persons who were supporting the opposition in another community of Salisbury, this is the one uh, a community member showing me um, a, a, a piece, a, a shot from what they be, believe to be a, a tear gas that the, the police use expired tear gas and showing us, showing me where the bullets or where the, the, the projectiles uh, uh, hit the community and people brought me and you can see the blood on the streets, on the, on the, on the porch um, there in, in Salisbury from um, one of the two persons that was shot um, um, from projectiles from RSS, supposed RSS shots. Afterwards, this woman is cleaning her streets from rocks that the um, community people sent um, and also things that moved around uh, in chaos in the middle of the morning and overnight when the RSS stormed the Salisbury community. Um, and you see a RSS soldier down there. I said it was a soldier from St. Lucia. He was a little sympathetic when I spoke Creole. He gave me a little bit of inside information, uh, which he was not supposed to give me, but you know, we, I didn't see that either, right? So this is the community of Salisbury there. Now, uh, as I wind down, one of the things that people said that now that the election was over um, on the day after, on the, the 6th uh, of December, um, Will the, the, the opposition and the government be able, to work, be able to work together? And the prime minister in his victory speech spoke a lot about trying to get the opposition to concede and the opposition still hasn't conceded some say uh, and, and accept the fact that the election was free and fair from the, the perspective of the prime minister and others who were around. So people were concerned about whether or not the government and the police would be, and the residents would be able to work together. And one 22-year-old uh, and one of the communities, a Labor Party supporter said, well, look at all of the trouble that the people in Mari got caused, the pictures that I showed you there. How will they expect to, to, you know, to, to win election as a matter, um, uh, as, as, there is, as a result of that? And, and actually, um, I'm indicating that part, some of the problem in Salisbury was from, was from, came from people of Salisbury uh, who are op also opposition uh, blocking of the road. Um, and the idea to them that the, 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 the opposition was perpetuating violence, at least that was that claim. 
And on the other hand, you have uh, uh, someone from Trafalgar that gave uh, um, a, t a testimony on that day that, that said that, well, the prime minister knew that if he had not given election reform, that there was going to be violence. And then he would use that violence as a way of showing that you shouldn't vote for the, for the opposition. So in a way, um, both sides seem to be guilty at, at, at efforts at winning at, at all costs. Now, why do these things happen? Um, the, the current president of the Dominica State College, uh, Donald Peters, wrote a book in 19, uh, 1992. And he says basically that if you look at the way um, politics happen in the Caribbean, most people who go into politics that is a, like a primary profession for them. A lot of them, a few exceptions, they do that as an income, as a living. And they seldom have jobs that would be better than what they would get paid and benefits they'd get paid as, as they would as a politician, with a few exceptions. And he said that incentive to serve is a major catalyst for the mindset. He doesn't call it winning at all costs, but what I call winning at all costs, that people will try to stay as long as they can stay because, hey, it's a good job. Uh, the question is, what are the ramifications for this? And in the conclusion, um, uh, one, I, I, I talk about those issues, but one of the things I did is I rose um, 10 propositions that, about what winning, and I already told you what it is, that we have to think about winning and victory. There are two different things. Winning is just counting the marbles. Victory is winning the peace. Uh, um, and, then, and then ideal victory is more, um, uh, winning at all costs more associated with violence, ideal victory more associated with peace. Um, that we, we, we need to, to look at, at these issues and to develop the, the idea of democracy or the conceptual dimensions of things. We need to develop the, the logistical dimension. We need to play fairly and win fairly. And after, after we win, we need to think about the consequences of those victories. So I'm hoping that um, uh, very soon I'll be making a big announcement, um, moving our whole headquarters to Trafalgar, Dominica, uh, developing Peaceology Acres. So get ready to vi vi visit our Peaceology Retreat where you can come to enjoy peace and the beginning of the world, the World um, Institute of Peaceology. And um, my friend from St. Lucia will also be happy to know that within the, the Peaceology, uh, within Peaceology Acres, hope to develop uh, what re I'm referring to as Creole quarters, like you have French quarters in New Orleans, Creole quarters, where we can get tooth bag eye Creole. We'll be able to get everything Creole there and we can develop the culture of peace from the village of Trafalgar, from the island of Dominica, from the Caribbean region to help fill the world, to move us from the perspective of violence and politics, move into politics and peace. Thanks a lot for the time. Thank you, Dr. St. Jean. Thank you for your thought-provoking presentation. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Darcia Leslie, a research fellow at Sir Arthur Louis Institute of Social and Economic Studies at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, Jamaica. Dr. Leslie coordinates the monitoring and evaluation of the postgraduate course. Her research focuses on the lived experiences of inmates and involuntary re removed migrants and the programs, policies and practices designed to support their effective reintegration. I now invite Dr. Leslie to make a presentation. Um, we must be mindful um, of the time. Um, we have, you just have about seven to eight minutes to make your presentation. And that will be also for the next speaker and then the answers and, and questions segment as we are running a little out of time. Dr. Leslie, proceed. Good morning, everyone. Many thanks to Dr. Descartes for the introduction, and also many thanks and congratulations to Dr. Wendell Wallace, editor of the series, for allowing us, myself and co-author Luna Sentifanti from the University of Liverpool, for allowing us to be a part of this important project that, amongst other things, pushes the boundaries of our understanding of crime and criminal justice in an interdisciplinary and Caribbean context. The series certainly brings to life, as was said in the opening remarks, the visions of sociologist Ken Price, who called for mainstream theories and studies to give greater attention to the nuances of culture, particularly in the context of decoloniality 
as well as that of Professor Dale Weber, former Pro Vice Chancellor for Graduate Studies and Research, who, prior to demitting the substantive post, took steps to create a medium through which UWE scholars in the field and across all campuses could work more closely with each other under the banner of the Crime, Security, and Justice Research Cluster. So again, we congratulate Dr. Wallace and all the contributors. It is indeed an honor for us to share this platform with you. We also acknowledge and thank Caribbean women scholars whose work seek to highlight the protection rights of Caribbean children, particularly Professor Aldra Henry Lee, child rights expert for her seminal work on the impact of incarceration on Jamaican women and their families. So against this backdrop, and as fate would have it, Luna and I came together to disaggregate a substantial qualitative primary data set on reintegration in seeking to spotlight the protection needs of children of prisoners in Jamaica, otherwise dubbed inmates in chapter nine of volume two of the book. Caregivers who were interviewed shared their lived experiences of imprisonment and in some cases also being left behind as a child due to the imprisonment of their caregivers. And so careful steps, including member checking, had to be undertaken in seeking to capture this dualism within this subsample. So the problem, as we understood it, was that since Jamaica ratified the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child, UNCRC, almost 30 years now, significant progress has been made in especially aligning relevant policies and legislation, which the chapter highlights. But there are also some glaring implementation hurdles, particularly as it relates to children on the margins or invisible children whose unique needs might be lumped into general considerations of all children as part of a generic policy and practice state response and in the face of competing priorities and capacity challenges. The second problem and motivation for developing the chapter was that except for the academic research work done by Caribbean scholars such as Professor Aldra Henry Lee earlier mentioned and Professor Maureen Sams Vaughan and advocacy work of NGOs such as Jamaicans for Justice, particularly in relation to children in need of supervision. We found that a potentially large part of the dark figure of child protection in Jamaica had to do with the need to shed more light on what happens to children when their caregivers are imprisoned. How do we as researchers, policy makers, monitoring and evaluation specialists and civil society groups ensure that these children do not slip through the safety net and become part of the cycle of crime and recidivism that hinders sustainable development. We also recognize the importance of the perspectives of caregivers in identifying the problem and possible solutions. So while the UNCRC is not quite the focus of the paper, it certainly provides a benchmark for assessing the protection needs of children left behind physically and within a social exclusion context due to the imprisonment of their caregivers. In this respect, the chapter, in addition to confirming findings from previous studies, including the effects of child shifting, it gives voice to caregivers and children, no adults considered on the margins and whose needs sometimes get lost in the child protection discourse. The ch chapter also highlights unique scenarios for child protection that involves migration and citizenship issues that would otherwise go unnoticed while drawing on ecological systems theory to make sense of the data while examining the theory's parsimony and what Fawcett refers to as pragmatic adequacy of the theory. So by and large, we draw on Article 19 of the UNRCRC in seeking to operationalize what exactly constitutes protection needs while recognizing that the standards of entitlement which this instrument outlines are based on widely accepted recognition of the fundamental needs of humans and in particular children. 
Article 19 de defines protection rights of children as involving state parties taking all measures to protect children from all forms of physical or mental violence, injury or abuse, neglect, or negligent treatment, maltreatment, or exploitation, including sexual abuse, while in the care of any person who has the care of the child. But what happens when a, when a mother has been deported? She's homeless and bankrupt, unable to return to her original community because of gang violence, is unaware of available interventions or what her children's rights are, and she feels helpless. Her children or child left behind in Jamaica is a girl who is believed has been sexually assaulted during shifting and is now mentally ill. The chapter highlights these scenarios and suggests the adoption of primary, secondary, and tertiary preventative strategies, including the need to collect robust monitoring data on this population of children that can be used to inform evidence-based decision. So the key message of the chapter is simple. A dark figure of child protection in Jamaica exists. We know this. This is not surprising. The dark figure includes children left behind due to caregiver imprisonment, and it is disproportionate and in violation of international norms and standards for us as a society to treat this group of children as being less deserving of protection due to the mistakes or crimes committed by their caregivers. As such, we, um, as the authors of the chapter, hope other Caribbean criminologists will undertake more research that seeks to shed more light on the social protection considerations and some of the recommendations of the paper will make their way into policy and future longitudinal studies. We also hope that you enjoy reading the chapter and look forward to your feedback. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Descartes. Thank you so much, Dr. Leslie. I think what you shared with us, it tells us as we understand crime, we should never forget our most vulnerable, our children. And I see that you're moving the work beyond the shelves of a library and to practice. And to our final contributor this morning, Dr. Randy Sipasad, one of our most prominent Caribbean criminologists and scholar based right here at St. Augustine campus, Dr. Sipasad is the coordinator of the criminology unit in the Department of Behavioral Sciences at St. Augustine. He's also a lecturer in criminology and criminal justice. He specializes in research methodology and statistics and has a research interest in economic deprivation and crime, gang violence, youth crime, and justice, as well as penology. Dr. Sipasad, I now invite you to make your presentation over to you. Good morning, Dr. Descartes, thank you. Um, at the outset, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Wallace for uh, putting both volumes together. Uh, let me just confirm, are you, are you seeing my screen, Dr. Descartes? Thank you. Yes, I am, I am thank seeing you. So yes, I, I, uh, this, the space that Dr. Wallace has created is certainly one that is extremely valuable for Caribbean scholars and I do wish uh, continued success and I hope there will be a volume three and a volume four uh, to follow uh, in, in, in with the high standards of volume one and two. The presentation that I'm going to focus on this morning is intimate, intimate partner violence, a Trinidad and Tobago perspective. This is a chapter that was developed with colleagues uh, from the University of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Linda Mohammed as well as Dr. Michel Thomas from Nova Southeastern University. Now, this chapter looks at several things and given the time frame, I wouldn't be able to place equal emphasis on each of these things. One of the areas of focus that's really very heavy on in the particular chapter has to do with the negative outcomes associated with intimate partner violence and especially with the treatment of some of the negative outcomes. And the chapter focuses very heavily on the use of cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, uh, instead of focusing more on that, what I want to do in this particular presentation 
is, I guess, uh, given the audience, I want to put things in perspective by sharing some of the statistics in Trinidad and Tobago so that we have a better sense of what is happening with respect to intimate partner violence, what's the scope of it, what's the nature of it, and I'll place less emphasis on some of the other issues uh, that were covered in the particular chapter. But I do invite uh, interested persons to read the particular chapter. Now, um, I present some data here from the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service from 2000 to 2013, which shows um, the, the number of reported incidents of domestic violence in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, bear in mind, these are incidents reported to the police. And as I make the point in a, in a subsequent slide, there may be a large proportion of incidents of domestic violence which are actually not brought to the attention of the police service. So we see the trends here uh, from 2000 to 2013, and we see, given the numbers, at least from 2006 onward, what we see is a bit of an increasing trend. The yearly average for this period is 1,362 incidents reported. And in this particular chart, I look at the percent of murders that is due to domestic violence, as well as the rate of domestic violence. And the rate here is calculated as rate per 100,000 population. What we see when we look at the rate is that the rate remains fairly stable across time, but that the percentage of, of murders due to domestic violence um, has decreased over time. It's not because the absolute number of uh, domestic or of murders due to domestic violence has decreased, but it's because the number of murders has actually increased, whereas the number of murders due to domestic violence has remained relatively stable over time. So the, the percentage has, has dropped because the number of murders has, has been increasing over time in Trinidad and Tobago. So that, that helps to put things in, in, in context. Nowadays, if you look at the statistics within recent times, we'll see that somewhere around five to eight percent of the murders in Trinidad and Tobago are as a result of domestic violence incidents. And quite incidentally, when we look in the prisons, we'll see that the, the larger proportion of persons who are accused of murder or who are convicted of murder have been uh, convicted of, of offenses in relation to domestic violence. Reason being that it's much easier to, to recognize or to, to define who the perpetrator is when it's a domestic violence incident. But let's say other types of incidents that result in a murder, such as a, a robbery or gang violence or something else, um, sometimes it's much more difficult to find out the perpetrator. And as a result, you find that, that it's, it's, um, there, there's lower representation of these types of persons uh, in the criminal justice system in the prisons of Trinidad and Tobago. This particular graph disaggregates the number of domestic violence incidents from 2000 to 2013 by the type of incident. So when an incident is reported to the police, the police record, records under different categories um, what is the nature of the incident that has been brought to their attention. And what we will see is that assaults by beating represent almost 50% of the incidents that come to the attention of the police. Then we have next in line at 28% threats and at almost 6% breach of protection orders. And then we have others such as uh, woundings, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, etc. This particular graph, um, I, 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 I hope lend some clarity on the, the gender of victims. What we would see from the data is that around 70% of victims are males and 30% of victims, sorry, 70% of victims are female and around 30% are males. So what we're seeing when we look at more recent data in Trinidad and Tobago is that the proportion of males represented in domestic violence reports are increasing. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that males are becoming victims more and more, although that could be part of the reason for the observed increase in more re recent data. Part of it could also be as a result of increased willingness of males to report and increased recognition by the society that domestic violence 
uh, is an issue that could affect males as well as females. And there are important implications for males as well as females uh, when incidents of domestic violence occur. Um, this particular graph gives you, again, from the police service data from 2010 to 2012, it gives you a breakdown of the age demographic of victims of domestic violence. And what you will see is that the largest proportion of them fall between the 20 to 39 year old uh, range, right? I, I, I should point out here that the 60 and over range, even though it looks high, it's really a residual category in the sense that it encompasses everybody who is 60 years and above, hence the reason that that, uh, that, that bar is so high. But if we, let's say we break down the 60 and above age range and we go in uh, smaller increments as with the other bars, what we will see is that there is a progressive decrease uh, in the proportion of persons represented as they get older and older. So again, the 20 to 39 year old range would really be the range that we see the bulk of uh, offenses being uh, committed against. This particular chart gives the ethnicity of victims of domestic violence for the period from 20, 2009 to 2012. Now, I must caution that you cannot take the percentages here to as an indication that certain groups uh, are being victimized more than others. Rather, what is happening here is that the percentages really reflect the demographic of the population. So in the population of Trinidad and Tobago, you find a very large proportion of persons of East Indian, African, and mixed descent. And similarly, the, the, the ethnic breakdown of the percentages would represent this demographic. So it's really nothing more than the, an approximation of, of the demographic in the population. If we wanted to understand um, whether certain groups are subject to domestic violence or are victims of domestic violence uh, in a disproportionate manner, what we would actually have to do is calculate the rates of domestic violence within each ethnic group. So we would have to take into account uh, the population size of each ethnic group in trying to understand whether certain ethnic groups are victims more than others. And of course, this is an important question uh, for us in Trinidad and Tobago, because uh, there may be cultural differences among ethnic groups, which may result in underreporting. And certainly, domestic violence is one of these issues which is prone to underreporting. Too often, uh, persons see it as, as strictly a family issue, and it's kept within the family where violence might be perpetrated by one person against another. And it happens over a period of years, and yet, uh, very little would be done about it by other family members. Uh, the incidents wouldn't be reported to the police. And sometimes you hear perhaps that it results in a death or even where incidents are reported to the police. Over and over, you'd hear stories of the police being very reluctant to deal with the issue because, again, the police are part and part uh, of, of the cultural landscape of Trinidad and Tobago. And, and many of them also hold the belief that um, domestic violence and, and incidents which happen in the family are private and they shouldn't really intervene, despite the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, which make it very, very clear that domestic violence is a criminal offense. Um, so the point that I make in this particular slide, as a lot of research has shown, is that while we're looking at police statistics to get a sense of the extent of domestic violence in Trinidad and Tobago, as I mentioned before, domestic violence is underreported. Only a fraction of the offenses which actually happen come to the attention of the police, right? One, one particular study of interest was conducted by the United Nations Development Program in 2012 when they developed a human development report on citizen security. And one of the interesting things of this particular report found was that the rate of domestic violence was actually 6.3 times higher than indicated in official crime data. So what this particular study did was that uh, data were collected from a population sample and people were asked to self-report whether they were victims of various types of crimes. And not surprising, when you looked at various types of offenses, you saw that, that people were saying 
that they were victims, yet they didn't report to the police. So, so my recollection from that UNDP report, for instance, when we look at other crimes, was that the rate of sexual offenses in Trinidad and Tobago was something like seven times higher than reported in police data. The rate of robberies and burglaries as well was approximately four times higher than reported in official crime data. So it means in the case of domestic violence that it is hugely underreported, right? And not just the UNDP studies, but as I mentioned, other studies here have supported uh, the same notion that domestic violence is underreported. And the key issue here is that there are cultural norms which really discourage people from reporting uh, incidents. So, so there, there needs to be a cultural awakening. There needs to be a cultural shift where people become much more open to talk about the issue of domestic violence, to seek help, to report the issues to the criminal justice system so that appropriate help uh, could be provided. Now, in terms of the consequences of domestic violence, I've hi highlighted a few here. And of course, there are consequences beyond this. The consequences that, that I've listed here are consequences to the particular individual. And these are this is just a sampling of some of the consequences, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, fear, anxiety, etc. But of course, there are a wider range of consequences. There are economic consequences, there are social consequences, uh, consequences of many different types of levels of domestic violence, which of course, as we've seen from the statistics and from the self-report estimates, really is a very serious problem in Trinidad and Tobago. In terms of, of, of the treatment of, of uh, uh, domestic violence, when it, when it happens, um, there are many, many issues that must be dealt with. And issues that must be dealt with go far beyond just treatment of the victims. When you're talking about a person in a particular home that's been victimized, um, they've experienced physical victimization, psychological trauma, etc. Of course, they need um, counseling, they need, they need treatment, they need various forms of assistance, but then there are other kinds of things as well that come into play, alternatives to housing, economic support, the legal processes that may be associated um, with the incident, et cetera, et cetera. So really what I'm trying to highlight here is that the issues that, that come up when you try to deal with the issue of intimate partner violence or domestic violence um, really are complex and multifaceted. The particular chapter um, concludes and focuses much more heavily um, on post-traumatic stress disorders and outcome of, of intimate partner violence and really makes a case for the use of cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, which is associated with uh, intimate partner violence. So, so CBT is something which was not uh, developed initially to deal with uh, domestic violence, uh, the experience of domestic violence. However, it is something that has been adapted and used successfully. There is a lot of research, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> which supports that CBT can be used very effectively in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, which is associated with domestic violence. And, and of course, I would invite interested persons to read uh, the particular chapter, which provides a lot of details on the use of CBT in the treatment uh, of victims. So with that, Chair, I, I would like to turn it back uh, over to you. Thank you, Dr. C. Passad, a very detailed and thorough overview, uh, moving beyond the crime statistics, but um, moving to understanding the implications, the psychological implications and treatment, um, understanding possible treatment for those psychopathology. Thank you for this. Um, and now to the next segment, which is the answer questions and answers segment, we do have Little time, so we may just be able to take one question. But before I go, there was a, a participant who um, wanted to know where can they purchase the book. The book can be purchased um, on Amazon or directly from the editor, Dr. Wallace. Um, an email, his email will be posted. So we have time for for one more question. For one question in this segment, there's a question on 
um, directed to Dr. Sipasad. Could you expound a little bit on the difference between what you meant by mixed mulatto ethnicity categories in your presentation? Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Descartes. So what we've used is the categories that, that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service uses. Uh, the ethnic situation in Trinidad and Tobago uh, is a bit of a complex one. And unfortunately, what we do see is that various agencies within the government use different categories and have different definitions. I guess this is not surprising given the very colorful history that Trinidad and Tobago and many Caribbean countries indeed uh, have experienced. So for instance, if we look at the Central Statistical Office, we'll see certain categories being used uh, in the national census and with certain definitions attached. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has, uh, again, some categories, many of which overlap with those used by the Central Statistical Office, but there are some, some uh, differences in the categories used by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. So, so in a nutshell, though, the, the definitions would be here, the definitions would be those as used by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service because the data that we, were, we used were from the police service. Thank you, um, Dr. Sipasad. Um, I just want to comment that um, so far, we have a lot of commentary going on in terms of IPV um, and it's under reporting, particularly during this time, the pandemic and the lockdown. So it's something that I think many of us as researchers would, would try to look into and uncover and see how best we can move um, that under reporting to reporting and get the statistics um, not, not, not fully right, but close to being um, right, I would say. Um, so it's just something, a food for thought for, for many of you, the researchers here, and for the commentary that is, that is ongoing at this point. So this takes us to the end of the questions and answers segment. Um, we have to move on as, as time is limited, and it's a time that we've all been waiting for to hear from the editor himself and to meet the editor, Dr. Wendell C. Wallace who is presently the Deputy Dean of Marketing, Distance and Outreach of the Faculty of Social Sciences, the lecturer in Criminology and Criminal Justice within the Department of Behavioral Sciences, UE St. Augustine. Dr. Wallace is a certified mediator with the Mediation Board of Trinidad and Tobago, as well as an attorney at law who has been called to the bar in England and Wales, as well as Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Wallace's research interests include policing, security, organizing crime, violence, gangs, and, and the tourism crime nexus. Dr. Wallace, I now invite you to give overall remarks. Over to you. Good morning, and thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, Dr. Christine uh, Descartes. First, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much for all the kind sentiments expressed by the presenters. Uh, your sentiments have humbled me. I'm indeed very much humbled by, by your words. I'm touched, I'm moved, but more importantly, I'm motivated in terms of moving on to a third and a fourth volume. The call for chapters for this book emanated from Ken Price's 1976 call for a Caribbean criminology. And that call was furthered by doyens of criminology, such as professors Harriet, Keane, and Diosaron. Part of the challenge that we face in the Caribbean is that it's difficult to find literature in almost any field in a structured manner. And the aim, my aim was to bring together researchers in criminology and criminal justice, or those looking at those topics in a sort of structured manner, so that we had volume one, we had volume two, and hopefully we'll be moving on to the third and fourth volume. Somewhere in one of my late night readings, I came across a quote, and unfortunately I cannot remember the author, but it said, working on your own is great, but working with others is a lifelong experience. And for me, 
working with others, working with so many other persons was indeed a lifelong experience. Indeed, it was no easy feat. I had to work with persons in different time zones, persons with different work ethics. I had to work with scholars who were senior to me, right? Um, I had to work with interdisciplinary researchers as is quite evident by the contents of the book. I had to work with different deadlines. I had to work with reviewers. Many of the issues that I faced were out of my immediate control. But nevertheless, I chose to persevere. And as mentioned by some of the presenters, the, that, that thought, that initial thought came to fruition in the context of volumes one and volumes two. So with that said, I must Thanks. I must say thank you to a host of individuals. I indeed, I owe a debt of gratitude to so many individuals. I'm going to say thank you in no particular order. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you to the 40 odd individuals who responded to the call for chapters. Indeed, I was overwhelmed and it was a hard task to choose 20 book chapters out of the 40 odd persons who submitted uh, their, their abstracts for consideration. But what that did is that it made the final product a very strong one. It made the final product something that we can all be proud of for every contributor to the Dr. Descartes and the St. John's and the Leslie's or Sipa Sadza and so many others who contributed to this book. I really want to express my heartfelt thank you. I want to thank, say thank you to my head of department, Dr. Talia Esnar, to my dean, Dr. Cola Lewis Cameron, to the ATS staff, to my family, most importantly, I want to say, you know, thank you so much for instilling in me uh, the persistence and the determination to go forth. I must say thank you to the Almighty, thank you to the Creator for instilling in me um, the virtues that I have today. Also to the institutions that were very much formative and instrumental in, those, in, in my formative years. To Keith Beckers and Associates, law tutors who gave me my first opportunity at lecturing to my high school, Bishop's High School in Tobago, and to all of the teachers, too many to mention, for seeing in me what I did not see in myself. To my students, I know some of my students are listening in. I am hoping that being here would serve to motivate you. Indeed, you are the future. You are the future lecturers. You are the future leaders of the Caribbean. And you are the ones that I'm hoping to motivate. So that in the third and fourth volume, I'm hoping that some of my students will be the ones who would be coming to the fore. In continuing and in coming uh, to close, when people think about a book, they think about ending. We had volume one, we had volume two, and that we are coming to a close. But importantly, do not see this as an ending see it as a beginning of something new. We will be moving into the third volume and into the fourth volume. So be on the lookout for that call for papers in 2022 or 2023. Finally, to everyone who made a contribution, whether minuscule or large, thank you very, very much for your effort. And you know, I must also say, Thank you to Westphalia Press for seeing the value of this book. And though they are based in Washington, DC, they saw the value of Caribbean perspectives on criminology and criminal justice. So I must say thank you very much uh, to the publishers. With that said, I hand you over to the moderator, Dr. Descartes. I say thank you, editor, for such 
um, inspiring and motivational remarks. As we draw closer to the end of this event, I would now like to invite Dr. Melissa Neptune Figaro, a lecturer in criminology and criminal justice within the Department of Behavioral Sciences, St. Augustine campus. Dr. Figaro will conclude in the wrap up segment. Dr. Figaro. Hi, thank you, um, Dr. Descantes. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody for participating. Um, it was very insightful. So I will start this wrap up by first addressing Dr. Wallace. We really appreciate um, the lengths you went to have this um, Caribbean perspective on criminal criminology edited. Um, I know that this is a stepping stone for criminology um, and I hope that we continue, especially with volumes four and three and five. Um, and I really like to thank the presenters. Um, I will start with just the opening remarks from our head of department, Dr. Talia Esnad. Um, she really was an inspiration in terms of pushing this forward. Um, and also I'd like to thank each and every one of the presenters, uh, Dr. Charles Katz. Um, you have done phenomenal work with regards to the police service. Um, and not only with Trinidad and Tobago, but the rest of the region with your um, quantitative methodology, it is really insightful, especially from a contextual level. Um, I'd like to thank um, Susan Horton, um, drugs, uh, money laundering, it is not only limited to Jamaica, but I mean, the rest of the Caribbean is seeing um, the backlash of this and having some insight and some thoughts on it, it really is inspirational because especially coming from uh, Trinidad where it is becoming to be very prevalent. So thank you for your contribution and I really appreciate it. Dr. Evans, it's really interesting to have a linguistics point of view. Um, I've never thought of it, especially um, just the translation, the transformation and how, um, you know, having two different languages and even understanding the hierarchy of, of languages um, in the criminal justice system. So we really, really would like to thank you for just this contribution and adding and don't, don't limit it to just criminology because I think it's an insightful, um, uh, uh, it, it's really insightful to know this idea of monological uh, of inspiration in terms of languages throughout the Caribbean. And I see that a lot of people here talk Creole, I don't. Um, so um, thank you so much for that contribution. Uh, Dr. St. John, peace, peaceology. Um, I think this was insightful. I don't think anybody thought about the idea of peaceology, um, especially in politics. Um, we look at it in a violent manner. Um, I teach terrorism. So we look at it more in a violent manner. Um, but we really do um, hope to see this idea of, of Dominica bringing forth peace. Um, we are wait to see how it goes. Um, and I thank you so much for your contribution to this um, virtual seminar. Um, Dr. Leslie, um, yes, we look at prisoners, we look at um, people within the criminal justice system, but we really don't look at the victims. And children are one of the most vulnerable populations. And I think that having this insight could actually be penetrated throughout the Caribbean, looking at this young population and how the criminal justice system is not shaped to exactly meet their needs. So we really thank you for your insightfulness into this um, volume of Caribbean criminology perspective. Thank you very much. Um, finally, Dr. Sipasad, one of my biggest inspirations, um, intimate partner violence. Um, it has been on the forefront of discussions, especially within our country. Um, um, it's good to see that you give some perspective on the statistics, um, but not only that, the treatment of, of, um, of this phenomena, um, especially women and men within our context. Um, having a database is good and just having perspective on this issue is something that I appreciate that came out of this edited book. Um, so to close very short, I'd like to thank everybody for um, their contributions. Um, all the students find this as a platform to move Caribbean co um, criminology forward. Um, this really is a stepping stone to advance scholarship within our context. And I would like to thank again, Dr. Wallace for putting this as a platform for us to use um, to bring forward um, scholarship and engagement. So thank you. So back to you, Christine. <laughs> Thank you, um, Dr. Neptune Figaro. Um, when the editor speaks, I have to submit. The editor needs a 13 second 
um, time just to give you um, one or two statements. Dr. Wallace. Uh, thank you, Dr. Descartes. Quite often we say thank you, and some of the persons who work in the background, we often forget them. And with that said, I want to publicly thank Mrs. Wendy Maynard and the team at Marketing and Communication for a wonderful job that they have been doing and that they continue to do. So to Marketing and Communication, specifically to Mrs. Wendy Maynard, I know that you're in the background working silently and quietly, but thank you for putting this event together and for bringing it off. There are two persons I'd like to say thank you to, and I know that um, one is with us and one um, is very busy at this time. The first person is Dr. Christine Descartes. She doesn't like um, all the glitz and glamour, but Dr. Descartes has been um, someone, she has been my sounding board for almost everything. In fact, Dr. Descartes was very much happy to, to order the foreword for volume one at very short notice. So I think it would be remiss of me if I do not say thank you very much, Dr. Christine Descartes, for what you have done for volume one. Second, Justice Ivor Archie, the Chief Justice of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. I suspect that he's at court at this moment. He's a very busy individual. Uh, he also wrote the foreword for volume two at extremely short notice. He did not question the rationale or anything. He simply asked, can I have a copy of the chapters? He read them and he was very much impressed and wrote the foreword at very short notice. Uh, so to the Chief Justice of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Justice Ivor Archie, another uh, member of the illustrious Bishops High School Tobago clan, thank you very much for ordering the foreword. Back to you, Dr. Descartes. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. So we have now come to the end of this virtual discussion on the Caribbean perspectives on criminology and criminal justice. Thank you for joining us. That's it for 